Since the very beginning of organized human conflict, intelligence and information have been vital pieces to winning any engagement. Knowing where your enemies are, how many of them are present, as well as their tactics and weaponry is crucial for planning an offensive or defensive strategy. In the world of aviation, reconnaissance aircraft first made their stake in the world of combat during the Great War. Pilots would fly over enemy territory to identify what units, numbers, and positions the enemies were holding. Let's fast forward up 50 years in the future. The United States is launching its first flight test of the most impressive recon aircraft ever to fly, the SR-71 Blackbird. Still holding the record for the fastest air-breathing manned aircraft, the SR-71 Blackbird could comfortably operate at a screaming speed of Mach 3.3. This would be the pinnacle of recon aircraft for some time to come. However, these aircraft were eventually phased out for the superior satellite. A spy satellite could be placed in geostationary orbit above a planet and have a constant surveillance over this area. This not only provided far more on-camera time for the targets, but also didn't risk human life to operate the satellite. Because of this, the speedy recon aircraft of the past were presumed to be phased out. But what if these satellites can't cover everything? Perhaps the target is too close to the poles of a planet for a geostationary orbit, or maybe the quality of the existing satellites in orbit are incapable of tracking a target in specific areas. Without a doubt, for this reason, there is a large network of satellites that can reposition or perhaps are just in varying degrees of polar orbit that could counter this, but once again you run into the same problems. Satellites may not be able to reposition themselves under certain conditions. And if you just saturated the area with satellites, that would undoubtedly cost many billions of dollars, let alone the almost complete inability to perform maintenance of an object in orbit. Especially a polar orbit like that, it would be incredibly difficult to actually maintain these satellites. Anyways, my point is, there are still situations where a recon aircraft may be needed. Let's fast forward to a more modern age. Electronics, engines, stealth, and sensor systems have all improved. What would it look like if we needed a new reconnaissance aircraft designed to deal with the threats of a more modern period? That's where my plane, the R-84 Pegasus, comes in. With hypersonic speeds, unparalleled range, and leading-edge stealth qualities, the Pegasus is up for the challenge. So what exactly does the R-84 need to accomplish to compete with such an advanced era of flight technology? Well, let's find out. Hey guys, it's Messier82 and I'm back with another flyout video. Today, I'll be showing you all how to build a hypersonic recon aircraft. Things have been going slow with finals impeding my progress, but I hope you guys will like this one. Of course, if you're excited to fly it, you can find the craft uploaded to my Discord server or the flyout Discord server. The links for both of those is in the description below. I hope to see you all there. However, there is a lot we need to accomplish with this thing, so let's not waste too much time on that. Here it is, the R-84 Pegasus. There are three main values I wish to accomplish with this thing, which we can break down into smaller sub-values. These three values are speed, stealth, and range. A speed of Mach 5 or hypersonic is a minimum for this aircraft, as well as a service ceiling of above 100,000 feet or just over 30 kilometers of altitude. This aircraft needs a way of reducing frontal RCS and utilizing plasma stealth to reduce the cross-section from other angles. More on that later. After that, we need range. While at Mach 5, I want this thing to be able to travel over 4,000 kilometers, or about 2,500 miles. As you all may know, flight performance isn't the only aspect of a recon aircraft. We also need to have spy systems such as cameras and other sensors aboard the aircraft to operate at these speeds. This isn't a capability of flyout at the moment, but ideally I would like to have a manned or unmanned flight option for this aircraft to give the operators as many options as possible as well as potentially reduce the risk to human life. And lastly, we need to finish it up with an operating cost of below 50,000 per hour at combat speeds. This essentially just ensures it that the aircraft is worth it to fly. With our design goals out of the way, it was time to show you guys how I would complete such an ambitious project. First things first, our priority for this aircraft was the fuselage shaping. The fuselage needed to maintain high supersonic speeds for several hours with relative efficiency. To figure out how to most efficiently shape our fuselage, we would be looking at our drag coefficients at supersonic speeds. Keeping our drag coefficient as low as possible would be a priority for maintaining supersonic flight. 
While the drag coefficient peaks at the sound barrier and reduces after, a good supersonic shaping was still required to minimize drag as much as possible. Take a look at this graph, for example. This is a pretty standard drag coefficient versus Mach graph for most aircraft. As you guys should notice, the drag coefficient starts low, peaks at Mach, and then goes back down after. This is generally why we refer to it as the sound barrier, because it's very difficult to pass it, but it gets proportionally, that word is very important, proportionally easier to pass it the further past it you go. But I emphasize this word so much because even though the drag coefficient reduces, that does not mean the battle is over. People often confuse drag coefficient for drag in general, which is completely wrong. So let's take a look at what drag is. Drag, in physics, is the force that opposes the relative motion of an object through the air. I take it we all knew of Newton's third law, for example, correct? Every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. For example, if I rest my hand on the table, my hand doesn't just phase through it and keep going, right? That is because as I push my hand against the table, the table pushes back on my hand. The atoms of the table directly oppose the atoms in my hand, therefore pushing back on them. It's the same thing with the air. As we push on the air, the air pushes back on us. Let's take a look at this. This is the drag equation. What exactly does it mean? Well, this universal equation tells us that the drag force is equal to one half times the density of the air, times velocity squared, times the drag coefficient, and finally times the cross-sectional area. Let's break it down into separate sections. If everything else remains the same and the air density increases, the drag will proportionally increase. That would make sense, right? When the air is thicker, it's tougher to fly fast in it. It's more soupy and thick and hard to push through. I mean, that's why most planes go faster at, you know, a higher altitude, right? The density's lower up there. Moving on from that, the next most important value is V squared. As the velocity increases, the drag parabolically increases. This means the faster you go, the drag compounds on itself more and more. A guy moving two times faster than his friend will have four times the drag applied. So essentially, as speed increases, drag exponentially increases. After that, it's the values we talked about earlier, drag coefficient and cross-sectional area, which is more or less just how aerodynamic and how big the vehicle is. My point is, as you might notice, that the drag coefficient is only one small part of this whole equation. And the most important thing to take from this equation is that drag coefficient doesn't mean everything. Remember that one supersonic drag coefficient graph we had earlier? Well, here is how it looks applied to the drag equation using arbitrary values. Even though that drag coefficient drops, it only creates a little divot in that whole drag equation and then it just keeps going up into orbit. Also, thank you to Aquila on my Discord server for helping me make these graphs, it's very much appreciated. Anyways, since the drag still increases the faster you go, even past the sound barrier, we needed to make sure that we could lower the drag coefficient as much as possible. As ultimately, the drag coefficient was one of the only values I really had control over. This essentially meant that my design needed to be as area-ruled and aerodynamic as possible. The nose, wings, tail fins, and engine positions were all designed to reduce wave drag as much as possible, allowing us to pierce the sky at incredibly high speeds. All of this work led to an incredibly low zero-lift drag coefficient of 0.005, and a total drag coefficient of 0.007 at cruising speeds and altitudes, therefore minimizing drag in just about every way possible, and leading to a top speed of nearly Mach 6. Drag, of course, isn't the only force acting on this aircraft that we'd need to focus on. Lift, for example, is also super important. Our aircraft would be cruising at altitudes of over 30 kilometers, or about 100,000 feet. There is very little, almost no air to generate lift with at this altitude, so we would need to optimize our lifting surfaces as much as possible to stay airborne. Starting at the nose, the front fuselage before the intake was shaped and designed to be a wave rider. Essentially, the bottom of the fuselage was designed to sort of cup the wave compression in a little bubble underneath the aircraft. Since this wave compression is higher pressure, it would help us generate extra lift at our cruising speeds and altitudes. Moving back from there, just before the intakes, a very large lurks and high lifting area wings were added to the vehicle. 
These were compliant with the previously mentioned area ruling and provided high levels of vortex lift and lifting body to keep an impressive lift drag ratio of greater than 7 at those ultra high altitudes. Two slanted vertical stabilizers as well as two forward placed ventral stabilizers added to the stability factor of the aircraft and were also designed specifically to reduce wave drag across the vehicle. The next force we needed to focus on was thrust. After we were complete with the wings and fuselage shaping, we got to move on to probably the most interesting part of the aircraft, the engines. The R84 Pegasus could not use a conventional style of engine as there simply wasn't a single engine that had the speed range capable of running this aircraft. We needed to be able to take off and get off the ground of course, so we needed something that worked at zero velocity, which rules out ramjets and scramjets. On top of that, we needed to be able to achieve hypersonic speeds, ruling out the use of turbines. There was no singular engine capable of achieving the range of speeds I needed, at least not efficiently or reasonably. So I ask you this, if I can't use one or the other, why not both? Take a look at this, the GT Falcon. The GT Falcon is a dual cycle turbine I will be using on this aircraft. It starts with the inlets and the turbines. At takeoff speeds, the inlet is in its open cycle. Air is freely directed straight into the turbine engines that sit in the front of the engine configurations. These turbines can achieve speeds of up to about Mach 2.5 on their own thanks to their lower pressure ratios and overall high speed design. The pilots of the vehicle will be instructed to climb about 10 kilometers altitude or 33,000 feet. From there, they will accelerate to Mach 2.5. And this is where stage two begins. The turbine inlets close up and due to the shaping of the inlet, instead direct the air straight into the ultra high speed ramjets of the vehicle. These ramjets are designed to achieve speeds greater than Mach 5, but still be able to operate at lower supersonic speeds such as Mach 2 Plus. This gives us the greatest range use possible and allows us to consistently and quickly accelerate past Mach 2.5 when the cycles change. On top of this, the closing of the inlets completely hides the turbine compressors and gives the aircraft a zero frontal radar cross-section, effectively helping achieve the stealth aspects of the aircraft previously mentioned. In flyout, unfortunately, there are limits to this engine setup. Flyout, for example, always assumes optimal airflow to an engine, so closing the inlets for the turbines doesn't necessarily negate drag. In order to fool the game into thinking there's no drag, because, you know, there shouldn't be, the engines were instead placed on joints where they would physically turn sideways in flight. This eliminates the turbine drag otherwise present through the engines and allows it to act closer to how it would in real life. Since the inlets are closed as well, there is no visual change to the aircraft in flight, which hides the weirdness of the turbine setup rather well. And secondly, of course, the ramjets wouldn't quite be as linear as I'd imagine they would be in real life, as the only in-game ramjet is a sort of toroidal setup. This makes the exhaust look slightly weird, but provides no actual disadvantages to its flight performance. Otherwise, my multiple cycle turbo ramjets were complete and provided relatively efficient thrust from zero all the way up to Mach 5. This meant that the cruising speed of the vehicle would be approximately 5 to 5.1, while the top speed would be about Mach 6. Could you imagine a recon aircraft screaming past you at Mach 6? Of course, for these high energy engines, we would probably need some high energy fuel to go along with them. After looking at various fuel types and conscripting the help of LDM from the flyout server, he helped me make a fuel referred to as HEF2, or sometimes nicknamed Zip Fuel. This boron enriched fuel was used on vehicles such as the XB70 Valkyrie and increased the energy density of the fuel by nearly 50%. This means we would be holding approximately 50% more energy aboard for the same weight, meaning a 50% increase in aircraft range. Using this fuel, I found my aircraft could fly over one hour at Mach 5. This meant my vehicle would have a range of over 6,000 kilometers, reaching nearly 4,000 miles. If you wish to cruise at Mach 4.5 instead, this range reaches over 7,000 kilometers. This thing could quite literally fly across the entire Atlantic Ocean in one tank of gas. Which doesn't sound too impressive until you realize it's doing it at Mach 4.5. Anyways, all of this was coming together to make one impressive aircraft, and I was pretty happy with it. Now that we are finally complete with the fuel, we get to discuss some of the most interesting concepts explored by aircraft of the past, as we now explore it with the Pegasus. 
To do that, I need to teach you guys about a new concept known as Plasma Stealth. Plasma Stealth is the technique of using ionized gas, or plasma, to reduce the radar cross-section of a vehicle. Plasma, or ionized gas, is essentially what happens when an atom gets excited. When an atom or molecule gets too excited, or too high energy, it can start to lose its bonds. It's a cloud of free-flying electrons and nuclei so excited by the heat applied to them that they can no longer combine. Just as boiling water forms water vapor, heating it even further would form plasma. This ionized gas is electromagnetically charged too. Those electrons have a negative charge while those nuclei remain positively charged due to the protons within. These electromagnetic charges allow the plasma to absorb a radar wave when it comes into contact. Such methods of cloaking aircraft were used on the mysterious Lockheed A-12, and little is known about the success of these experiments to this day. What we do know about the A-12 in different plasma stealth programs is different, however. We do know that the A-12's fuel contained a special cesium-based additive known as A-50. Why would they use cesium, you might ask? Well, let's think about cesium's properties. Cesium is known for its high reactivity as it is an alkali metal. On top of this, cesium was observed to be easily excited into plasma in extreme heat of an aircraft's exhaust. Applying this research, I decided that was likely the R84 would also utilize some sort of fuel additive plasma stealth, or perhaps a direct injection of cesium based substance into the ramjets in a theoretical quote unquote stealth mode. Due to the extreme speeds of Mach 5, Plus, this vehicle would generate plasma of its own too. So if we wanted to cloak the front end of this thing, we wouldn't even need to generate any new plasma, we'd just need to direct it. It would also be safe to assume that such ionized particles could be directed across different sections of the aircraft through a series of charged surfaces, therefore even further increasing stealth. In this theoretical stealth mode, plasma would be injected to the exhaust, as well as the plasma on the front of the aircraft being sent in different directions via a series of electrical charges. This would lead to the aircraft being able to directly cloak itself while in flight. On top of this, the zero frontal cross-section in ramjet mode led this aircraft to be its own sort of unique stealth vehicle. So with stealth shaping, stealth materials, stealth fuel, and stealth electromagnetic redirection of plasma, our stealth aspects of the vehicle were complete. While it isn't often mentioned, the camera and detection suites on recon aircraft are some of the most impressive technologies they feature. Take the SR-71 for example. The Blackbird used ultra-thick glass with a 70mm film camera on the other side of it. In the age of this spy plane, it's safe to assume we wouldn't be using film anymore. Two high-resolution digital cameras were placed in special retractable bays just under the intake of either side. These digital cameras would be operated by the second seat aboard the aircraft or the recon systems operator. This recon systems operator would later get two MFD screens for controlling aircraft systems as well as the cameras, therefore taking some of that load off the pilot. From there in the second bay below the engines would contain the landing gear. There isn't much to be said about the landing gear other than it uses custom inputs to generate a delay and take more load off the pilot. If anyone's wondering how to do fully working custom landing gear bay doors, you can take a look at my example. Once again, it'll be in my server and the Flyout Discord server if anyone wants to check it out. From that point on, we moved on to complete the atmospheric sensing equipment aboard the aircraft. This would involve multiple redundant pieces of sensing equipment, as so that way no singular piece could fail. I modeled a custom static port, an alt static port, three separate tubes for measuring airspeed, and of course two AOA indexers. This allowed our computers, as well as our pilots, to get all necessary pieces of in-flight information about the aircraft as they could ever need. This combined with the time period appropriate GPS systems would mean that these pilots would essentially never get lost. Ultimately, this meant that no one would really need to focus on the aircraft systems too much. The pilot could focus on flying, and the RSO could focus on recon. Moving on from there, perhaps the most difficult property to master in any of these high-speed builds is simply the heat. At Mach 5, temperatures of over 1,900 degrees Celsius could be observed all up and down the leading edges of the aircraft, as well as temperatures of over 2,000 Celsius in the combustion chamber. This is above the melting point of most metals. Some pretty extreme materials and engineering are required for such high temperatures to keep the vehicle from melting. 
First, we need to take a look at the hottest areas of the vehicle. The hottest parts of the exterior naturally would be the areas with the most compression or with the shocks nearby. For this, we would be looking at the nose as well as the leading edge of the wings. These materials would without a doubt need to be lightweight, heat resistant, and strong. One of such materials I have been researching is known as hafnium carbonitride. With the hottest melting point of any known material, as well as unparalleled strength, oxidization resistance, and thermal conductivity, such materials would make an ideal source to reduce the leading edge heating. Due to the extreme cost of such materials, however, it is likely limited to the leading edge of the vehicle and the hottest parts of the combustion chamber. In contrast, other materials such as titanium or nickel alloy with a lower melting point would be used to reduce heating along the less stressful parts of the airframe. This material we were speaking of earlier could also be used inside the combustor, as well as denser materials such as tantalum carbide to handle the highest heat possible, both inside and outside of the vehicle. Anyways, I encourage you guys to research these materials yourself, as it has many practical modern applications to spacecraft, and it's just overall super interesting to learn about. Moving on, in order to provide the pilots with higher levels of visibility, materials such as sapphire glass or quartz glass could also be used for the window structures. Both glass types are known for their high strength as well as their very high melting points, but I would imagine on an aircraft as such, the windows would not want to be in areas of high stress anyways. The framework of the windows would later be reworked to provide a more structurally resilient shape. Another, less material-based cooling method that could be used on the vehicle is known as active fuel cooling. This method was used in the SR-71 as well as many rocket nozzles. Essentially, the fuel is run around the engines or areas of extreme heat before reaching the combustion chamber. This is because the temperature of the fuel does not matter. Higher temperatures can even be beneficial for the fuel inside the combustion chamber. You could theoretically help an impulse issue as well as solve a cooling issue with this one modification, but ideally I can't see it being used for much more than airframe or engine cooling. The final touch of external cosmetic modification to our aircraft before designing the interior was the lights. The lights of this aircraft still needed to follow FAA compliance, but there was an issue. At high speeds, things like beacon lights or anti-collision lights could potentially generate significant drag. On the Pegasus, I decided to add fully retracting landy, taxi, and anti-collision lights to eliminate high-speed drag. After the landing gear comes up, the only visible external lights on the vehicle are the nav and strobe lights which would be turned off over hostile territory anyways, but since these lights generate negligible drag, they get to stay on the outside. The last thing we needed to work on before completion was the cockpit. First things first, we needed to discuss safety. To protect the pilots in the event of an ejection, a fortified ejection pod was added to the nose of the aircraft. You see, at Mach 5 for example, a normal ejection would probably just disintegrate you. As it turns out, human disintegration isn't very survivable, so we need a solution. The solution was a completely encased internal fuselage piece that could be separated from the rest of the craft in the event of an emergency. Since we had a full pod inside the aircraft, that would go with the pilots of course, I decided to include an ejection survival kit inside. This involved two shotguns, a med kit, a fire extinguisher, backpacks, and several days worth of food and water rations. This would ensure the highest chance of survival post ejection as there was a high chance of ejecting into hostile territory. On top of this, a modeled scuttling charge was included within the aircraft. In the event of an ejection, the aircraft would soon after blow itself up entirely. This was to prevent any hostile nations from recovering the technology used to build the aircraft. I was debating whether or not I also wanted to include cyanide pills in the ejection kit in case of capture, but I think that's a little bit too brutal. Moving on to the actual cockpit design, the pilot mostly got aircraft control equipment such as the basic radio, startup and flight controls, engine controls, and the basic engine and atmospheric gauges, as well as a more advanced navigation suite. The RSO or recon systems operator on the other hand got two MFDs and camera control equipment along with a more advanced radio. With this along with the survival kit, the aircraft was complete. It was time to fly out. Today will be a little bit unusual for segmenting. We are going to include a brief montage here, and after that we are going to continue with a short film centered around the crew of this aircraft. The film will be called R84 Pegasus Into the Fire. Stay tuned for that on my channel. Make sure to subscribe and like if you want to see more like that. Either way, see you guys in the air.
Sentinel Control, taxi to runway 7 via Alpha, clear for takeoff. Expect an eastbound departure. Hey you all, I did a quick little test flight in this thing before wrapping it up just to show you guys some in-flight time. From our calculations as well as our fuel burn, we figured out that we could travel a little bit over 7,500 kilometers, which is just over the typical flight between America and Britain, for example. It did this at about Mach 4.5. If you wanted to, you could speed it up to about 5.7, but obviously you wouldn't get the same fuel time out of that. Anyways, I wanted to let you guys know that we're trying to make a little short film centered around this aircraft and its crew. That's what those voice lines are from, and we have many more to come. Unfortunately, the production of that's been slowed down from multiple people on the team getting COVID. It's, it's been a little bit of a disaster, but I will release that one. You guys wait. Just you guys wait. Got some other projects on the burner right now anyways. If you guys would like to see any other games, feel free to let me know. I'll see you guys in the next one, and thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Until next time.